the wife of Clopas. After which, we will read, uh, I'll just read a letter that I received this week, uh, a, a, a testimony really of what Holy Week means for um, a friend of mine, and, and we finish with prayer. A reading from Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered, gathered the, the whole co cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was in agony, believe me, I know. I've seen it often enough, crucifixion. All the day's work for me. And I've heard a few hell for mercy over the years. So they tell me for sheer pain. Slow, lingering, dreadful. But he was different. It was the curious thing. I could see he was suffering all right. He was there in his eyes, in the grit of teeth, in the writhing body, in the sweat pouring from him, and most of all in that last awful groan. He never complained, never screamed, never swore, funny that. To be honest, I've never seen anyone quite like him. That look he had, even in death, as though we were the ones suffering, as though we were the criminals deserving punishment, as though he felt sorry for us. Ridiculous, of course. But you know, I could swear as he drew his last breath, there was a smile on his face, almost like he felt he'd achieved something. An odd business, very odd. Lord Jesus Christ, we, we praise you for your ministry, your love, your faithfulness to your calling. We, th we thank you for your willingness to face even death itself so that we might find the true meaning of life. We thank you for that sense of purpose, that inner courage, that you gave you the to continue on your children's path to the very end. Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us that having received so much, we give so little. Forgive us that we shy away from sacrifice and denial. Forgive us for taking the easy and less costly way rather than the way of the cross. Help us to deny ourselves, and so too, Find life in all its fullness. Our next testimony is from John. 
uh, the beloved disciple, as often described. And this is a reading from Mark 50. Mark chapter 15, verses 22 to 26 and 33 to 34. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide which each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription on the charge read against him, the king of the Jews. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was groaning, a sound like I'd never heard before, a sound I never want to hear again, awful, stomach churning, indescribable, a sound of unimaginable pain, of overwhelming sorrow, of utter isolation. And I could watch it no longer. I thought I was ready for it, prepared for the worst, for he knew he had to die. But I wasn't ready, not for this. I never realized people could suffer so much, that anything could be quite so terrible. But I know now, I'm telling you straight, I'd have felt sorry for anyone facing that. A robber, a mugger, a murderer. My heart would still have bled for them. But to see Jesus there, a man of such gentleness and compassion, a man who'd always loved, never hated, a man who'd brought healing to the sick and wholeness to the broken, it all but finished me. What had he done to deserve it? What crime had he committed? What was it about him that aroused such passion, such devotion, yet such loathing? I prayed that God would finish it, put him out of his misery. Still the torment continued, still they mocked him, delighting in his pain. I knew he was suffering, but even then didn't realize how much not until he lifted his head, I saw the despair in his eyes. Not until he spoke, I heard the wretchedness in his voice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When I realized my blood ran cold, he felt alone, totally alone. Abandoned by everyone he'd loved and trusted, even by God himself. He could cope with the rest. He'd even expected it. But, but God? It was the final torture, the ultimate agony, a pain beyond words. It was groaning. A sound like I'd never heard before. Sound which suddenly I understood, sound I could listen to no longer. Lord Jesus Christ, you suffered so much for our sakes. Pain of mind as well as pain of body. The pain of waiting for the end. The pain of mockery and rejection, betrayal, denial, and misunderstanding. 
The pain of flogging, of thorns pressed into your head, of nails driven into your hands and feet, the pain of hanging in agony on that cross. Lord Jesus Christ, as we celebrate all you have given us, help us never to forget what it cost you. And the next testimony we will hear comes from the centurion. And we first hear a reading from the Gospel of Luke. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. Oh, he was special, that's all I can say. Not like me to hand out compliments and ask anyone. I've seen all kinds, the real dregs of society. Murderers, rapists, and muggles, you name it. And I've watched them all suffering without a shred of conscience. Good riddance to them, that's the way I look at it. Felt the same about this one too. The first, last a troublemaker. Should have thought more carefully, shouldn't he? Before he started raising expectations, stirring up the crowd. But as I watched him, it all changed. You couldn't help but be impressed. There was something about him. The quiet dignity. The complete composure. The sheer courage of the man. Nothing could shake him. Not the mocking or the spitting. Not the lying or the jeering or the flogging, or the interrogation, not even the thorns twisted so cruelly into his head. When it came to the end, as he staggered under that cross, just about all in, as the blood spurted from those hands and feet, as the life seeped from his broken body, still the same. He actually had time for others, more than for himself. Time for one of the two wretches hanging there alongside him. Time for his mother, his friends. Time for his people who stood to gloat. I mean, for us. Amazing. Son of God, some of them called him. You know what? I think they might have been right. He was special. No doubt about that. Loving God, we recall, we, we recall, recall with gratitude the faithfulness of Jesus. His faithfulness to the last his willingness to take up the way of the cross, his courage in the face of opposition, suffering, and death. Help us to respond, consecrating our lives to his service. Help us to be truly thankful for all he has done and continues to do. Help us to acknowledge him as our Lord and Saviour and live today as his disciples. final of the four testimonies is from Mary 
one of the witnesses at the cross, the wife of Clopas. And I will read Bible reading and the prayer, and on you will do the meditation. A reading from John, chapter 19, beginning at verse 25, continuing verse 28 to 30. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He was silent, quite still, his body limp and lifeless, like a rag dog, like a broken puppet. And I thank God that at that at last it was over. His ordeal finally ended. But it wasn't, not quite. He moved again, just the faintest twitch, the last flickering ember of light. But enough to prolong our hope, enough to prolong his pain. He was still breathing, still suffering. We watched, wretchedly, torn by the the longing to see him come down and prove his enemies wrong. The longing to see him find peace in the cold embrace of death. But suddenly his eyes were open, wide, bright, triumphant. The lips were moving, eager, excited, exultant. And his voice rang out, it is finished. An acknowledgement of defeat jumped out of it a last despairing cry of sorrow. But it wasn't, not for those who heard it, not for those with ears to hear. It was altogether different, like sunshine after storm, like rain after drought, like laughter after tears, gloriously unexpected, wonderfully <laughs> encountered, staked all and one. Defeat was victory. Darkness was light. Death was light. I didn't see it then, mind you. I can't pretend that. It was just a glimpse at the time, a glimmer, barely understood. But what I did see, with sudden staggering clarity, was that until that moment, until that last victorious shout, he had lived with the awful burden of holding the world's faith in his own and wondering whether he could see it through. At last it was done. He had honoured his calling, fulfilled his mission, walked the way of the cross. It was finished, and with a song in his heart and joy in his eyes, he bowed his head and surrendered his spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, once more we remember that last week leading up to the cross. We remember your pain and hurt as you faced betrayal, denial, rejection and abandonment. And we confess with shame that through our faithlessness, our weakness, our sin, we have added to your pain. Lord Jesus Christ, mercy upon us. Help us to follow you more faithfully. Amen. Just before our concluding prayers, 
During the week, I was sent a, a testimony um, by somebody living, but um, a friend of mine, Ted Hayes, uh, who was in Wexford for many years, and now is in Dublin. But it's a testimony not unlike the testimonies we've just heard, except this is a testimony from a disciple. A disciple from 2021 imagining being there in Holy Week. And I have to say, it's, be it's beautifully written, as you see. Uh, Ted has beautiful handwriting. Um, and I'll read it for you. He just says, this is a little something I wrote as my Lenten project, and I hope you like it. We're all safe here in Brabazon, and hope you are too. God bless you. Ted. The cheering is getting louder now as it approaches the beautiful gate and any minute now we will see him. I'm glad I got here early to get a good position and I've laid my second best suit on the road as I had no time to collect calm. So much has been talked about him. I feel I already know him least about his exploits. Did he not raise the man in Bethany? And did I not meet Tom, the blind beggar, the other day? And he able to see as good as you or me? Sure, he must be the Messiah. Who else could do something like that? The noise is getting close now, and people are straining to get their first sight of him. Hey, who are you pushing? You think you own the place? Then I see him, yes, just like the prophet said, riding on a donkey. The crowds have followed him for miles, and now he enters our capital to a monstrous welcome. Here in Jerusalem, we know how to welcome important people. There can't be anybody more important than himself. Sitting down, it's hard to tell how tall he is. I'd guess about five foot seven. He's smiling, waving at the crowd. But there's this kind of sadness in his smile, as if he was thinking of some unfinished business or perhaps some disappointment. How he is able to smile at all beats me. The religious police here, aka the Pharisees, hate him. And only for the crowds would arrest him if they could get their hands on him. They have a terrible way of dealing with people they don't like. And then he stops, looks at me. I look around hoping it's somebody else he's looking at, but no, it's me. He just says, follow me. I get all confused and start to say things like, no, I, I'm okay. I worship every week. Uh, that's my coat or donkey you're standing on. Where are you going? Could lead to whips and blood and perhaps more. Please don't ask me to dive for you. And he gently says, I don't want you to die for me. I want you to live for me. I want you to see with my eyes the suffering in the world. To listen with my ears to the cries of the poor, marginalized, and the lonely. Could you speak for me? And I say, yes, Jesus, I can do all these things. And he passes on. And on Friday, as he struggles through the narrow streets of the city, carrying that dreadful cross. I hope he looks back and sees me. And I will shout, your gospel of love is in good hands. I will tell your story. And he passes from my sight not from my heart. Thank you.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that all might come within the reach of your saving embrace. Clothe us in your spirit that we, stretching out our hands in loving labour for others, may bring those who know you not to knowledge and love of you. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Lord God, it's not easy for many people right now in this pandemic. We depend on you, Lord, to carry us, comfort us, keep us strong for one another. May this time of trial be also a time of blessing, as in our fears may we see that you are strong to save. On this Good Friday, may our way to hope and new life be in the way of the cross. Through Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's join together in saying prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and forever. Amen. We just finish with the collect for good food. Almighty God, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sin and to suffer death upon the cross. He was alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just before the blessing, I say that tomorrow, Holy Saturday, Easter Eve, at 8 p.m., as we have each week, each day of Holy Week, we will meet here again on Zoom, just before the glorious day of Easter Sunday. I'd just like to thank Anya well for not just reading but also the technical help in making all this possible. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, be with us all this good Friday. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Sometimes they might share something. Mm -hmm. so they can actually share their screen with 